Um, so kind of first out is, as I say, talk about the digital or computation. And so the question is, you know, who of you are using digital technology in your work already? So I'm not going to get a response. Uh, but I'll respond on your behalf because it's, you know, kind of how I do this lecture. And that is, I would argue that all of you are using digital technology in your work. So this is where I'm coming from, is that uh, digital technology, you know, kind of and computers is just slowly easing into our workplace wherever we are. Um, and if you've been firing a kiln or if you've been working in the glass studio, all of those kilns are going to be digitally controlled in which case you is cheating, you know, kind of with digital technology, if that's the attitude that one takes. Um, you know, th th that's me saying, oh, I've heard things like, oh, 3D printing is cheating, you know, that um, uh, it's not, it's just another tool set and that's what we'll be going through. Um, so tools and then kind of where the hand fits into this, I think are important features and, and what I want to try and, and deal with here as well. Um, so what is I'm saying, you can imagine kind of if you want to um, uh, be a Puritan about what you're doing, then you should be, in theory, firing your kilns in a traditional manner, whatever that is, and that is getting wood or bonfiring or whatever you're going to do. Uh, and so we've gone over to electric kilns, and that's a more useful way of firing kilns. But anyone who uh, wood fires is going to see that as an easy way out. And then electric firing further to that, we use digital controls to do it. And so it's just a matter of ease. You know, it's just the tools we use. And then the bottom image here is, is obviously glaze calculation. And you might be buying in glazes, um, uh, or you might be doing your own glazes. And again, it's the power of the kind of technology that just eases our life. So we make use of it. So why not? Um, so I think then put on top of that is thinking through, okay, further, how is, you know, kind of tech really changing the way artists work? Uh, and um, although we tend to think of our work as being that what, that goes up on the plinth, you know, and goes into exhibition, it's, a, you know, sort of, um, this is talking from experience, it's the whole thing that goes into kind of keeping you working as well. So your administration. So obviously, you know, emails, bookkeeping, word processing, um, the digital sort of revolution or whatever has absolutely uh, changed that. I mean, I started potting in days with old typewriters. You know, if someone wanted a CV, it was a matter of kind of trying to type out the CV and making sure you had enough copy paper in so you'd have a couple of copies of your CV and so on and so forth. Uh, and then if one looks at, you know, marketing and promotion, you can kind of try and put yourself back before a, a days of digital, um, you know, and internet, uh, you know, the revolution that's happened through the internet is the way to be able to do self-promotion is, is just extraordinary in comparison to where it used to be. You know, we used to photograph our, our, our work with, you know, sort of old SLR cameras with, um, old type slides in them and then you'd get your 10 slides together and you would send your slides off to a gallery so you'd have to have a whole bank of a number of slides to be able to send to different galleries uh, and then you'd wait for these slides to hopefully be sent back to you one day whereas now you know let alone the social media where you just put a portfolio on on instagram or something like that um, but being able to actually send photographs around is just amazing in comparison to um you know what it was and then on you know online selling obviously is another thing that previously it was very much in person either uh, going to gallery selling through galleries or selling through fair, uh, craft fairs and things like that whereas now there's the potential for selling online um, you know that said I I don't I must admit because um, I well I'm not very good at selling, uh, but putting that aside um, is, I do think we are dealing with physical objects here. And I think that, um, you know, on the whole, unless the public know your work really well, they want to see the physical objects. Uh, so online selling does obviously work, um, but I think we're still in the world of physicality. And knowledge acqu acquisition and dissemination, again, that's, you know, just sort of kind of obviously where the digital world has moved things along amazingly, you know, with self-education. And I'm a great one for self-educating. 
Um, you know, I, you'll see at the end of uh, my talks today, I put a lot of stuff on YouTube and stuff like and, and that. Um, and I just sort of feel that, you know, people get hold of me and say, do I sell, uh, you know, teach online? And I could do, but actual fact, my reach is a lot better just to try and put stuff out on the internet. People find it and then they can actually self um, decide as to exactly what they want. Um, and then finally, kind of networks, communities, there was the time where, you know, I think as an as artists, it's really useful to have that little network, but it was, you know, in physical days, it was very much about people that you could associate with closely. I'm obviously working in an area that, um, you know, sort of, uh, there's not that many of us uh, 3D printing in clay. But and a lot of those are, you know, spread around different countries, but I can very easily keep in contact with them. So I suppose the whole kind of technology and um, the actual physical working with this kit has been transformed just through the, um, uh, you know, the information revolution that we've gone through. Um, so, you know, that's a long rambling way of saying that whenever I kind of talk about the way I work is say that I think it's really important that um, whatever we produce is a reflection of the technology in which we are actually, you know, living and surrounded by at the time. Um, you know, I sort of just feel it's, it would be really weird if um, archaeologists dig up ceramics in 100 years' time and they think, gosh, this is amazing that these people had iPhones and so on and so forth. But then they're still making these tea bowls that look like something coming out of China, you know, sort of or from the, from. Uh, East, East Asia, and you just think, gosh, that's a really mixed up culture that they've got, you know, the iPhone in one hand and some kind of retro pot in the other hand. You know, I think it's really important that, as I say, the objects you're making should reflect the culture and, and technologies and culture is, you know, technology is part of culture in the society that you're living in. Anyway, so that's kind of a bit of a rant there. Um, oh, that's right. So I'm just constantly letting people in as well. So then from that, it sort of then goes on to, okay, we start to then talk about tools, all right? Although a piece of software is a, you know, sort of obviously quite an abstract tool, it's sort of inside your, your laptop, it is still a drawing tool. It's a tool that enables you to draw. Obviously a pencil you can pick up and you can draw with that, whereas on screen you can then start to draw three-dimensionally with a piece of software and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, I have no answers for this, but I'm just kind of really bringing it up. It, it intrigues me that, you know, when is something a tool and when is it a machine? And then when is an instrument, you know, kind of going across here. A hammer, we tend to talk, think of as a tool, but at the same time, it's a machine for hitting your nails, at an extreme, or it's even an instrument for, say, for hitting your nails. Um, and uh, so again, you know, by the time you start to use 3D printers or um, uh, you know, CNC cutters and things like that, digitally guided to um, uh, tools, instruments, machines, I think ultimately it comes down to what your relationship as the creative is to that tool that you're using, as much as it is with a pencil. You know, someone can pick up a, a ruler and draw a straight line, or they can just kind of work freehand and put more expression into that line by using freehand. So similarly, you know, these are much more sophisticated machines, tools, instruments, um, but it's the way you actually use all this kit that finally becomes important. And I have to say, I, you know, right, I'm trying to possibly big myself up a bit, but I would really do think, you know, the kind of 3D printers, by the time the knowledge that I have of those things, it's an instrument that I'm using, you know, as, as in, the, in the pianist over here. And, you know, the old pottery wheel, you can jump onto that pottery wheel and just use it as a mass produce and, and a machine to mass produce ceramics. You know, you just throw it very fast. Or you can possibly, you know, as in here, this kind of leech kick wheel, work much more slowly and in a much more expressive manner. So, you know, again, I don't know what you want to start calling that. You know, it's an instrument, it's a tool that anyway, it's under your control. You're the one in, you, you know, in control using this tool. So then does it come down to the human hand? Uh, again, as I say, I, you know, through this talk, I really, I, I'm really raising points and you can kind of go to, go with it as, as you want or not. Um, but uh, 
you know, I get a lot of feedback again as to, oh, you know, don't you miss using your hands? Um, and I mean, yes, I do, but no, I don't. At the end of the day, once I've actually, you know, printed a piece and I can stand back and look at it, I just think that's just amazing. I've managed to make that piece today um, that if I was coil building it by hand, it would take me days and days and days to do. Um, and uh, I've got to the same position that I could have got to through my hands as well. So again, you know, it's that sort of thing that I think the as long as the final result is what you're after, then, you know, let's use this technology stroke tools as we can. And so sort of around, you know, the arguments I have around the kind of this, this thing about, oh, you know, handmade is good, mach machine made is questionable, let's say, not even bad, but just questionable. Um, and I don't like kind of thinking in those narrow terms, whatever's right for you. Um, you know, and just to try and illustrate that this, this hand-cooked chips here or crisps, a packet of hand-cooked crisps, are they going to be any, you know, kind of tastier than potentially mass-produced crisps? Who knows? You know, it's the quality of the material that goes into them the flavorings that go into it, there's so much more to it. One just has to remember that this whole kind of handmade bit is potentially a marketing, bit of a marketing exercise. You know, you will see fairs that are, you know, sort of handmade objects. And, and I appreciate what it's saying in short term is that these are, are, you know, at this fair, there will be works that are precious, I suppose, because they've probably had a lot of work put into them, but they have been heartfelt pieces. Um, and I think that's ultimately what you want to do, is just have works that speak of the human heart as much as anything else. Okay? Um, so again, just kind of illustrating the downside of this whole sort of handmade um, kind of uh, argument is um, this uh, vase coming from IKEA 2018 is, it was a slip cast vase. And then at the factory, slip casting factory out in China, the workers were told that when it came out of the mold was to actually with their hands just squished a little bit, as you can see here. So it had this sort of the sense of the human hand. And I just think as a design concept, that's really, really weird that, you know, you still are using the mass produced technique of, of casting but then it's got this sort of layer of the, the human on that, the hand on that. Kind of it is interesting, but it also is just weird. Um, anyway, uh, and then further, just there's a, a list of other things that, you know, I have a bit of a, a problem with the whole handmade. I had a student at one stage who did quite a bit of research into how well the public understood what handmade was. Um, and certainly within the ceramic world, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of public cannot tell whether a piece has been handmade or how it's been made ultimately. Uh, and so I think the handmade hang up there actually comes down to a little bit is your own therapy. Uh, and I think you need to bear that in mind as well. And that is if you really enjoy doing what you do with your hands, then that's great. And ultimately, it's probably for you. Because can the viewer actually read that? You know, sort of, um, so you need to disjoint what the viewer takes from it and the pleasures that you take out of working with your hands. I mix all my clay by hand because I really love the feel of clay, you know, of wet clay. So there we go. You know, that's my therapy. Um, so uh, thinking through this further, something like throwing rings, I mean, I always kind of a have a little chuckle to myself, this idea, oh, yeah, look, it's been handmade. You can see the throwing rings on it. Well, yes, it's the hand on the, the object. But in actual fact, it's a machine. It's, it's a, a result because it's been turning around a machine and then you put your hand there. So in actual fact, it's a machine mark as much as it is a hand mark. Okay. Um, and then... I, I, I pointed out my last lecture coming from, from South Africa and kind of an, an ethical point of view. I think when be the hand or the idea of the handmade is very much a kind of a luxury object as well. Um, and that being that in developing worlds, handmade is seen as, um, as often as exploitative as well. Um, 
you know, and uh, if uh, people in developing countries could have a bit of tech or something that would help them be able to make pieces, surely, you know, you, you wouldn't deny them. And so us in the developed world saying, oh, something, you know, we've, we've handmade this and therefore it is, is, is better for some reason or other. Um, is the economy that we live in that we can actually sort of do these things and, and potentially sell them. Um, so I, I think there's, there's something in there. And then finally, this point about the art market, um, that is a bit of a hang up of mine, again, kind of along with that ethics as well. Um, but, you, and it's not only in ceramics, it's across the whole kind of art world. And ultimately that's where we're working. And, you know, it's the art market that moves us along and so on and so forth. And we want to have these exhibitions. But if you're going to be a blue chip um, artist represented by, you know, sort of a high-end gallery that, you know, sort of, do you want that or not? I have no idea. But you actually have to going to be very productive um, because they need that turnover to, you know, keep your name up there and so on and so forth. Uh, and you're probably going to have to produce more work or, or your studio is going to have to produce more work than you can produce yourself, in which case you're going to need to get assistance. Um, and then is it any better if I use this machine behind me to help do my coil building or do I then get in some assistance um, to, to do it? You know, so I think that, you know, that's just kind of get out there. Right, so this page is how I try and sort of think about, just move the window. So I'm moving the windows around here. Um, you know, the digital or, or computation. And I think firstly, I, I feel there's kind of a hindrance between a lot of the vocabulary that is used. And that is because, you know, new technology wants to try and promote itself. Um, you know, I once saw I was um, needing to read a, um, um, an academic paper um, uh, for somebody in South America. And my response to it was, you've sort of couched it all around 3D printing. No, there's no mention of coil building. And coil building is the tradition that this, you know, kind of printing that I do comes out of. And he said, oh, well, you won't get any um, financial support for a paper or research into coil building where you will get financial support into 3D printing. And you just, uh, it sort of makes you realize, ah, yes, you know, it's actually the kind of terminology you use. I mean, it can, as I say, also backfire that I think if, you know, you exhibit your ceramics and you say, oh, it's been 3D printed, then people say, oh, well, where's the skill and so on and so forth. I hope over these number of lectures, lectures you'll realize there's a, a, a lot of skill in there as well. But the, you know, the kind of human consciousness is that, oh, you know, sort of printing, you just kind of knock it out. That isn't necessarily the case. Uh, it can, you know, in some kinds of printing can be, um, but actually there's a lot of craft in it as well. Um, so the sort of the, the, the vocabulary and terminology becomes a, you know, a hindrance or not sort of thing. Um, you know, I use these WASP printers and WASP get hold of me. Um, and, uh, you know, they say, have you got space in your labor laboratory for another 3D printer? Uh, yes, I always have space for another 3D printer. That's, that's no problem. But this point of, oh, it's a lab, as in fab lab, fabrication lab. So again, you know, no, I just have a workshop that is a studio. So, I mean, already there's a bit of wordplay going on there. You know, an artist studio, a craftsperson's workshop, wow. And now we've got a laboratory where you also make um, ceramics. Um, and uh, then another, uh, this is kind of more practical point of view, is that a lot of the software that we use and to point the hardware as well, has been developed for, you know, other, um, fields, all right, or technologies, and particularly in engineering. So um, this is getting towards the softwares, the drawing softwares that I use, or heading towards the drawing softwares that we use. Most of the softwares have been developed for engineering. Um, and so, you know, the way you use them is very much about kind of measurements and that. And you'll see I, the, the software that I use is actually being developed much more for uh, animation and is much sort of softer and much more kind of arty, I would claim, than a lot of the engineering um, softwares. 
All right. So then this actual point about, you know, kind of what is digital? I don't know, you know, sort of if if we're in a tighter group or tutorial group, you know, we could have the discussion, but I'm, I'm not going to do it now. I actually prefer to call it, you know, computational clay. And that is that the real kind of driver is the ability of these laptops, computers that we have to compute very, very fast and just to work through stuff very, very fast. That, that's the, the kind of really breaking point. Uh, and so that's a very objective point. And, um, you know, how that changes our lives, that's something much further down the line. That certainly working out in France, there was a very strong uh, backlash, uh, you know, against um, uh, social media, you know, the world over. And so digital and the idea of computers, you know, you get people saying, oh, well, actually, I, I work in clay because I want to get away from the computer. And I understand all that. But I think, you, you know, you don't want to be blaming the technology, um, the potential of the tool set because of what social media is and so on and so forth. So again, you just need to unpack between the sociology of all of this technology uh, and the practicalities of it as well, I think. Uh, so then I do that, you know, saying, okay, right, how would I treat any other sort of material and process in my studio? Um, and so I reduce it down to that sort of craft level of saying, okay, my material is the bits and bytes. In other words, noughts and ones. I mean, that, that's the, the, the digital, okay? And uh, if you were, as we do, working in clay or in glass, you have your material or in metal, I've no idea whether metal people are, uh, are, are joining as well, is then plus a process, and that might be blowing and glassing or kiln forming or casting or you know, who knows what, um, you then get a result at the end of it. So it's a material that over time and through processes and your creativity transforms into something else. Um, and for me, I'm doing just the same here is that I'm using a material of bits and bytes, noughts, and then the power of computation. So that's this laptop that we're obviously working on. Inside that is a processor that can think really well, can do, do calculations really fast. And then you attach a piece of software to that um, and you can start drawing and you can start doing, you know, kind of all you, you need to be doing. Or that same little mini computer is then actually sitting in the machine and it runs the machine and, and similarly does that as well. Uh, so kind of, I think of it at that very objective level of just material and process and then you've got to offer the input to it. Um, so another reaction I get is, okay, you know, I hear what you're saying, but really uh, all of this mathematics and this kind of um, uh, 3D stuff just, you know, is not me. That's something out there. Um, I'll just get on in the real world. And, I, you know, I, again, everyone to their own, but I actually say that, it is all built on the real world, you know, that uh, the kind of apparent magic that is happening um, is, you know, sort of developed out of tradition as such. So we all know what left and right is and up and down. I mean, that's the physical world that we work in. Um, and uh, so for computer graphics, obviously up down is then the Z direction, uh, front back is the Y direction, left right is the X direction. So when you, you know, go into working in, in 3D in, on computers, that's the virtual world that you're working in. Um, and, um, you know, within that, uh, uh, the graphics there, zero, zero, zero would be the very middle point here. And so this becomes a kind of a, a graph left and right. And so if you go out left, it's negative. If you go out right, it's positive. And then similar in the front back one, you know, going away from you is negative, front is, and then up is positive and down is, is, um, is negative. So then if you are, you know, working the physical world, you might coil build something in, you know, sort of your left, right, up, down space. And we can do exactly the same in the virtual space. And then in the virtual space, the computer can start to pinpoint any point in that virtual three-dimensional object. And so you can see here, I just get this out of the way so I can see what's going on. 
Um, this would have come out on the X direction by, you know, kind of one, two, three um, markers. However, that's broken up. So you can see there I've gone X3. Um, in the Y direction, we haven't left the zero point. We know they're at the back or at the front. So that's obviously zero. And in the up down, we haven't started going up or down. So the, the Z is in the zero. So, I mean, how, that's how this X, Y, Z bit goes. You know, hopefully you can all get it. You've all done some maths at some stage. Um, so, you know, as we go round and round, as I say, you can plot any point over here. You can see the X is now over in the negative side of things. You forward of, on the Y side, so the Y is a plus, and we haven't yet risen, whereas up here we started rising up, so the Z has got some numbers as well. Um, and uh, so that kind of apparent magic that is happening, you know, they say, oh, well, you know, new technology, this is the new world we're in. No, not at all. Back in Renaissance times, they were using exactly the same sort of three-dimensional graph system, but obviously analog to be able to scale something up. I mean, these are, are, are artisans doing stonework or sculptors and um, that you'd have original model and uh, go and measure that up in the X, Y, Z. And then that could be carried over and all those measurements or all those points transferred onto your next block as something a bit bigger. And so you can appreciate this can kind of go back and forwards as well. As much as you might do a virtual drawing you can also, and so that's how scanning works. A scanner is, you know, measuring something in three-dimensional space, turning that into numbers, and then making a virtual model within the um, uh, computer space kind of thing. So here I just wanted to talk about the principles behind actually, you know, th uh, computer graphics. You've got the X, Y, Z bit. Um, and it all works around points, okay? So ultimately within three-dimensional space, the computer understands a point and it's then a matter of joining the points. So uh, you, there are curved lines, but in principle in computer graphics, there aren't really curved lines. It's one point and the next point and the next point with a line that actually joins it. Uh, and uh, the computer is reading that X, Y, Z point of each point, and then it knows just to draw a line in between, as you know, in our cubes over here. But then we're working on surface as well. So as soon as you get into three-dimensional surfaces, you have to have at least three points, one, two, three, and then you've got a surface. So in your modeling programs, you're very often, you know, here I, I must admit I'm talking, I'm thinking. Um, very much about um, the Blender software that I work with and Rhino that is the other software that the university teaches is a bit different. Um, but uh, you often, you know, you'll see reference to the point and the edge or the line or a, a surface. Um, and so that construct, construct any three dimensional form. You know, it's, it's, I'll, I'll talk about a mesh, like a chicken wire mesh of the, obviously, offering you this three-dimensional shape uh, and then that become become solidified by the surface and then you get the object uh, so inevitably the more detail you want the more points you have to have to then bend around okay because they say that uh, you have to have a point a straight line between each point and that's what the uh, computer graphics is measuring uh, so to get round in a circle, you have to start having lots and lots of little straight lines, and then the mesh gets finer and finer. So if you're doing a sort of a scan or you've got a much more detailed object like a, a portrait, then the mesh has to become much, much finer. Um, so another thing just to point out, obviously, those of you, if you've been doing 3D modeling, you'll know all this or probably bumped into it that uh, they start to talk about quad meshes and triangular meshes. Um, and that is that this mesh here, this uh, sphere you can see is made out of squares or quads, whereas the next mesh is actually made out of triangles. So triangles actually on the whole, it gives you a much more, um, a finer kind of grain to the shape. Uh, and so you'll find that a lot of, um, uh, uh, scan shapes will be made out of triangles, uh, but I think it's because of the graphics. The graphics are actually easier with quads, 
But uh, if you ever ask to work between quads, quads or mesh, if the program says to you quads or meshes, you know, kind of um, just be happy with either, whatever works kind of thing. Uh, and then the other kind of um, uh, terminology I would flag up is this point about perspective and orthographic. Uh, and I've shown you with the cubes up here, this uh, cube is in what we call perspective mode. So when you're working in your drawing package, there will be a button somewhere that will probably say, oh, do you want to look at it in perspective? Do you view it perspectively or orthographically? That's perspectively, obviously, it's like going back into the distance, whereas orthographically, um, it's this is the same shape when you output it. If you gave that to a machine to build, it would build the same shape, although it looks differently. Um, in orthographic mode, down the bottom here, orthographic, the front edge is actually the same length as the back edge. It hasn't been perspectivized. Um, and uh, I tend to work in this most of the time, particularly if you're trying to line things up. It's just if it's in perspective, something behind would then, you know, the camera, virtual camera makes it smaller further back. Uh, whereas if you uh, work in orthographic, something that's at the back of the scene would be the same size ultimately as the one in the front. So you can sort of do line up and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so on this slide, I just wanted to talk about the actual file size, um, because this can start, you know, depending, I would imagine you'll probably be working on laptops if you're mobile or, you know, if you're using the department machines, they're all pretty powerful. Um, but once you start getting into 3D graphics, the file size can get really, really big, uh, and uh, then your machine might start battling to work a little bit. Um, so here you can see, you know, this square here, or the two cubes at the top, as I say, all the computer has to be told really is where the eight corners are. And knowing where the eight corners are, it can then fill in the lines and then it can fill in the faces and so on and so forth. So this is actually the, the file in human language or language we can start to see for a cube. And in actual fact, these, however many lines there are, are really just the X, Y, Z of the point. And then this other reference is then the lines and the color and direction and this, that, and the other. Uh, so anyway, a very simple mesh, you know, a cube, four kilobytes, kind of the size of a text message. That's no problem. You know, your telephone can handle that or a really old fashioned telephone can handle that. Uh, to make a sphere, as I say, you've got to have many more points because then the lines have got to kind of, you know, go around, go around, 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 around. So you start getting a smoother sort of sphere. So a sphere, and in actual fact, this is the sort of the read out file for a sphere. You start to get, to get to an email, you know, 65K kilobytes. Again, all your computers can hold and handle that. That's no problem at all. It's when you start getting into much more complex sort of meshes and where it's really dense as a mesh, um, that uh, your computer can start running into trouble. And in actual fact, if you're busy modeling or trying to distort or do something, it's a lot easier to sort of work on a shape like this than when there are so many little points. Um, and it, you can, you know, sort of, if you go off and get a scan done, you can get a file back that is, you know, you know, 10 times bigger than this file. This, it wouldn't be uncommon to get back a, uh, a, a scan file that is 20 megabytes, you know, um, two megabytes is kind of the size of a smallish photograph, you know, a, a medium quality photograph anyway. So again, you know, now our telephones uh, can handle that, but um, a decent laptop can, can handle a two megabyte file. But if you, you know, get some scanning done and you get back, you know, something that is 20 megabytes or, or even more, um, if your computer can handle it, that's absolutely great. But in most modeling or drawing packages, there's um, a, a tool that will say decimate, and then you can reduce the number of points and it reduces down the file size. I mean, that's kind of technical getting some, somewhere else. Uh, but the, the real point I want to make is that you don't have to be working at a fidelity that is higher than the machine that you're working on. Um, and uh, so behind me, I tend to use a two millimeter nozzle. So you can imagine any detail that is in my model 
that is smaller than two millimeters isn't going to be, get picked up by the machine. You know, the machine is just going to override it. So if I had a scan of my, and this happens to be my mother, that is 20 megabytes or something, um, all that very fine detail that is in that high quality scan isn't going to be picked up the machine, in which case I may as well knock it back and work at a sort of a fidelity that is correct for the machine that I'm working at. So there's just a logic to that. And, um, you know, machines are slowly getting faster and faster in a way. Right, so um, now I just wanted to go through um, kind of, as you can see, what, what I, I like to term a ways of working. And that is that I think very often you get this general sort of view, oh, it's a digital work. And so it might be um, that it's been, you know, made with some digital, uh, digital um, aid. But then within that, it can be broken down as to kind of quite how the artist is working, the ways of working for the artists. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sort of digging myself a bit of a hole by actually dividing it up into to five different sort of um, uh, techniques, I suppose, because I'd also want to try and claim that, oh, there's, you know, crossover between these and there's probably, you know, lots more ways of working that I haven't put in. But I think this starts to give you some, some background. If this is a route you're going down, you know, you could start to look at any one of these five routes. Uh, and concentrate that and work back. So I actually work in computer coding and something called processing, but then I actually also need a modeling program to do all my editing in. So the analogy is there that you, you know, working as a photographer, someone might uh, go out and take photographs, but you then still need something like Photoshop to actually do the editing. So um, I need a drawing program to do the editing of the original sort of image that I've captured in the code or the model that I've captured. Um, so uh, I prefer to talk, talk about drawing software, although I think on the whole, it'll be called modeling software. And it is, it's for modeling shapes. Um, but I very much like the idea that you are drawing in three dimensions. Um, and, uh, I'll show you just kind of screen grabs in a moment of these, but last week I spoke about the very sort of simple entry level ones. So Tinkercad and Sculpfab are those. Um, and then these last three are sort of high end industry standard um, softwares. Uh, Fusion 360 is, is very kind of engineering focused. Um, and um, oh, I forget what the parent company is. Um, but it's uh, if you are going down the route of uh, Fusion 360, you can look it up online, um, uh, and it is a you know a really really good uh, package. Um, uh, but you can and and it's but it's a pay package. You, you know you have to buy it and and on can be on subscription or outright. But I think if you sort of start looking in the small print, you can as um, uh, a small company. Uh, certainly be able to get it for free anyway. So Fusion 360 can be for free. Uh, and then Blender Rhino are the two packages that get taught at, um, you know, particularly get taught at uh, RCA. Um, and Rhino, it has to be, so I've, I've got a bit of a love-hate love -hate relationship going here in that I work in Blender. It's a free, it's an open source software. So uh, a guy out in uh, the Netherlands, a good 10 plus years ago, who was an animator, he sort of felt right, okay, we need an open source animation program that's three dimensional. Uh, so he kept raising funds and then getting the um, uh, uh, programming done to actually build the piece of software. So this piece of uh, Blender, if you go online and just look for Blender, it's got a governor orange, um, color to it, um, you can download it. And, and one slight drawback is that because it's, you know, sort of this open source thing, there are, are constantly updates done. Um, and so it's sort of always cha changing, I suppose, any bit of software is. Um, and so I tend to, you know, download it. And the version I'm using at the moment is probably at least four years old. And it does it absolutely fine for me. But, um, you know, the really nice thing about this open source program is that if I'm doing workshops, I can just go into a class and say to the class, right, guys, download Blender, we get on and we start and go now. 
Um, now, it's not uncommon that something that is free like this is then seen as lesser. And I think people are slightly suspect of that. Oh, you know, it's free, There's something wrong with this. I tell you, Blender is absolutely amazing. The, you know, the quality, what you can get out of it. Um, so, uh, you know, I've got a bias towards that. But I have to be careful in that Rhino is more the industry standard, particularly in architecture and probably in design offices. So if by any chance, you know, you can see yourself going in or looking for employment within architecture design somewhere you know, further down the line, then you need, you know, you must put your time into learning Rhino because that will make you more employable. It's as simple as that. If you're always going to be independent like myself, then Blender is absolutely fine, you know, although I can do all, you can do all the jobs. Um, there is one other thing with this, and then we'll get onto in a moment, this parametric design. Um, has really been developed within Rhino. Um, and uh, so if uh, parametric design is something you want to do, then Rhino is probably the way to go. But, you know, Blender has its version as well. Um, but anyway, this is, you know, your modeling drawing programs, and I'll look at those a bit closer in a moment. So then the next, you know, and that is very much using your mouse and you are kind of drawing in three dimensions and getting things to link up and, and so on and so forth. Parametric design is, is similar in a way, but it's much more using the, uh, the numbers. Um, and uh, I'll show you a screen grab in the moment, in a moment. But, and what is happening here is that I've got Rhino slash Grasshopper, because Rhino obviously is your drawing program. And then there's an add-on called Grasshopper, a free add-on. And you, you know, um, virtually plug that into your Rhino, and then that gives you a whole new tool set that is, in actual fact, little boxes on the screen that you can fiddle with the numbers, and you start doing your modeling much through, much more through models, through the parameters, through models, through num through numbers anyway. So what you would be sort of doing is say, you in your Rhino, you would get a sphere. And then in the grasshopper, you'd be able to tell the sphere to then multiply itself five times and create a circle or something. You know, that's very simple. But you start to work in this much more modular manner, a parametric manner. And you can, you know, it's absolutely transformed the aesthetics of um, that way of working has transformed the aesthetics of architecture in that architects, you know, they, they use it a lot. They can sort of construct a box and then uh, you can start warping, moving that box through numbers, and the box, you know, does all sorts of more things, and then that creates the shape as such. So the, the uh, architect hasn't sat down and designed each little element. They've morphed one element into the next element into the next element through computation, through numbers and, and formula and things like that. So that's what this parametric design is. Um, uh, Blender has also a plugin that is, this is the Russian word for grasshopper because it was developed by some Russian uh, programs. Then I've got an area that I call copy, cut and paste. And so, you know, I think that if you're going to kind of get into generically kind of mash up ways of working, you're still probably going to have to have some sort of modeling program to do your editing in, of which either Blender or Rhino is probably the way to go. But at a lesser extent, you can do it in Tinkercad and you sort of when getting off the ground early days, you can use these sort of much more basic programs. And copy, cut and paste is, you know, or the mashup is about one just grabbing files from the internet or actually doing scanning yourself and then adapting the scanning. Um, and, you know, literally collaging it all together in three dimensions. VR, we spoke about a little bit last week, and it's the Oculus Rift that I've used. I've never used the Vive. Um, that uh, I think is an interesting way of going. You can see I've put VR or augmented reality in that. I, I like the idea that is actually augmenting our reality rather than working. You know, you may well do your drawing in virtual reality, but you know, you'll be heading probably to outputting it through a machine, in which case, you know, turning into our reality. So it's an extension of our reality that we're working in augmented reality. And then a fifth way of working is kind of very abstractly, much more with coding, 
Um, and uh, so these are just different coding languages and something like Python is the language that Blender works in. And if you kind of have done some coding and you sort of want to get into it, you can actually within the Blender software, and I'm sure you can do it in others, it's just this is, uh, happens to be the software that I know, you can bring up a window where you actually code into the window and then what you put in your coding comes is offered as a visualization in the Blender program. And that's the same word I'm doing with the processing as I work in the code and then I get a visualization. Um, so these are just some screen grabs. Uh, this Tinkercad software that I've been talking about, you can see it's a, you know, a very simple layout here. And then down on the right-hand side are all these sort of pre-made shapes and you just pull them in and drop them onto your work surface. And then you can scale those you know, and, and uh, change the proportions of them. And then you can either turn them to be positive or negative. So um, this shape that I've got on here, I actually would have just pulled on a sphere, uh, kept that as positive, and then I pulled on another sphere and made that negative. And then you sort of, you group the work together and you tell the one shape to subtract it from the other shape. So that um, my negative sphere, sphere would have then taken a bite out of the big sphere. And then I would have moved it around and probably taken another bite and another bite. So the sort of apple core effect is done, made by you know, taking negative shapes away from a positive shape. Um, over here is your uh, navigation. Um, this box on the right, you can literally put your mouse on and kind of navigate around that or with uh, your left right click, you can navigate here as well. Um, this uh, sculpt fab. Um, oh, so yeah, it's just a Tinkercad, as I say, it's online, search it out. Uh, it's free to join, but you do have to just sign up with it, have an account. And that is because all your files are then saved online. Uh, Scalp Fab again is an, an online sort of thing. You just search it out and then you, you um, uh, start working with it. And this is much more like sort of virtual sculpting. What they do is when you start it up, you have a very dense mesh that is just a sphere. Uh, and then over on the left hand side here, you have a whole lot of tools um, and you can start distorting and molding and sculpting that sphere with your virtual tools and that pulls pushes squeezes so on and so forth uh, so it's a much more organic way of working this is kind of much more um, uh, box like obviously much more organic and then in this case you would actually just file file download download uh, an stl file from that and it arrives you know in your downloads um, and then that can be taken and, and printed or altered i mean you can actually make something in this program and then import it. You can see there's an import button. You can import it into this program and start mushing some of this into it as well. Um, and then this here is the Blender layout. As I say, the Cura is something we'll get onto later on. Um, so I haven't got any screen grabs of Rhino there, um, but uh, Rhino is something you can learn through the um, RCA. Um, now, certainly, you know, I mean, I, this is when I was starting out, I was thinking, you, know, you, you can get on, and if you're drawing on a piece of paper, you draw marks and you sort of um, give it a bit of shading and it looks like three dimensions, but it only looks like three dimensions. Here, working in VR, we are actually building in three dimensions. So how do you actually start drawing in three dimensions? Um, and so these are some of the techniques. So the first thing here is something called bullion. Um, and that is the principle of that Tinkercad program is where you are off, offered ready-made shapes and then you either stick them together as in here or you subtract one from the other. So, you know, Boolean modeling is a way of, of building things. Now, once you've actually stuck them together or subtracted them, you can then go further and do more editing and more editing um, of each little point later on and combine the different ways of work working. But that's Boolean. Then the sculpting, as I said, what happens here is that you offered a mesh that is very fine in detail, a lot, a lot of little points, you know, a lot finer than this mesh here. 
Um, and with your virtual tools, you literally grab the surface and start pulling and pushing it and so on and so on and so forth. Now, one thing I use a lot in Blender and that's, you know, I really like about Blender is that I can work like this, but Blender has, you know, sort of um, um, worlds that you can work in where you can then uh, go over to sculpting as well. So it actually Blender offers both these ways of working, you know, what we call mesh editing as well as sculpting. Um, now, the images along the bottom here are just more kind of ways of drawing with any, any um, modeling program. Uh, so Rhino works quite a lot like this, is that if you've got a shape you want to draw out, it's, it's something called a lofting, and that is you draw the path of the shape that you want to do, you then draw the path of the you know, cross section of that. And then you know, with, put, with clicking of buttons, you tell it to literally extrude this sphere along this path. And so you start getting this pipe. You know, and then having done that, you can start expanding the top or adding on other bits. So you can imagine having sort of drawn a shape like this, you draw a profile, a lathe or an epoxy wheel, uh, you have a, um, uh, a plan view and, uh, uh, sorry, you, you draw a profile and then that gets spun. This is only going to, you know, uh, three quarters way around, but it would normally go the whole way around. So, uh, you know, computer graphics can do that very easily. And then this is something called subsurf um, and uh, is used a lot in, um, in animation and things like that. Uh, and um, in, in the Blender program. And then what happens here is you actually model something quite coarse. So you can see the dots here are the kind of the coarse, and that's what you're working on. But that has then been subdivided to give you a much, much more detail underneath that. So you can see the surface has got nice curves on it, but there's this sort of um, you know, black frame around it. And so I can go in there and grab one of these points and pull that point, and then the shape underneath would sort of morph in the direction of that point. That's called su subsurf modeling um, and uh, is kind of common way of modeling as well. So that was the drawing, sort of different ways of drawing, parametric modeling. This is now the Rhino layout, and it's kind of the tools and things that you have for work working with Rhino. You can see some of these would be for doing lofting and so on and so forth. Um, but then this is the add-on that I spoke about is the grasshopper. And that offers you lots of what they call little nodes. And each one of these nodes, you just have to know the information. But there's a bit of code sitting inside here. And you visually, you pull from the end of this one and you link it into there and you pull the link it into there and you just kind of have to know all this stuff and do a link across there and a link across there. And then as you slowly do all that, and then this is a color bit as well. So with all of these nodes and here, these parameters, you can start to design all these different shapes over there. That's kind of a parametric modeling, as opposed to, you know, in the drawing program, you draw this one, and then you would sort of finish, and then you'd go off and draw this one, and so on and so forth. This gives you much, much more sort of um, repetitive modular type uh, working. Um, right, the uh, copy, cut, and paste that I outlined. Um, I, I just flagged up here something called scan the world. Um, oh, you'd have to do a search for it. I forget who the, which website it actually is. Um, that won't come to my head here, but if you, if you search for scan the world. Um, and what they've done is they've managed to acquire the three-dimensional scans from museums around the world. Um, so, you know, the VNA here, Museum Rodin, you can see um, the uh, objects from the Louvre as well. I think there's cat or certainly this is in the Louvre. Um, and you for free can then download those images if that's the sort of iconography, the imagery that you want to work using your work. Uh, and then obviously these um, three dimensional meshes can be imported into either Blender or Rhino or into any of those other packages. And then you start to pull them around and add to them, or you just print it straight if you're happy with the way, way it is. 
so that you know that's a ready downloaded um, uh, um, three dimensional model, or obviously you can do your own scanning. Um, and now within scanning, there are you know physical scanners that you hold, and with some sort of beam they read what the shape is, and then they give you a three D scan. And then there is also something called photogrammetry, and um, uh, I've you know use the photogrammetry most. Uh, if you can get a high-end scanner, fantastic. I think if you ask the tech support to do some scanning, they'll probably tell you just do photogrammetry. And with photogrammetry, you get a camera and you photograph the object in three dimensions. You wander around it and photograph it. And then you take those photographs and you load them into a um, piece of software. Um, the one I've used is AggieSoft. And then that will put together a 3D model from, from those photographs. I mean, you know, the photograph the photogrammetry has been absolutely amazing. Um, and so one sees those television programs of kind of looking at three-dimensional spaces underground and wandering around um, Venice and places like that. All that is done with, with um, photogrammetry, with photographs that have been um, sort of uh, put together into three-dimensional meshes. Uh, then the VR, augmented reality type thing, as I say, this is working with um, the uh, media package that was, you know, came with uh, the hardware that I was using anyway. So this was an architectural friend's office that I was working at, um, uh, and within the package that he had um, was the, the program that I made use of. Um, and uh, so if I click on to the next. Uh, you can see that you know these these are, are models that I actually did while working with it, um, and uh, this is working with Wasp out in Italy. Uh, I found it really useful just sort of for for demonstration purposes to have these. This is actually this form here that has has been printed out there. So this. Um, seam in the middle was because there was a change over the clay container halfway you can see a clay container down here um, but we discussed a little vr last week um, i will flag up there's a program called mesh mixer um, so if you are do working within vr it'll output i should think an obj um, file um, and um, I read, I haven't actually done it, but I think the guys using the VR machines are then putting that file, OBJ file, into Mesh Mixer. And Mesh Mixer is the piece of software that really sort of pulls it all together um, and uh, completes the, the file. I, I want to say a lot more, but I think I'll just confuse you if I sort of start to get into technicalities too much. But YouTube's the place, you know, if that's the route you're looking at, you kind of find the terminology you're using and search it out on YouTube and there'll be lots of people trying to assist you there, I'm sure. Uh, and then computer coding, as I say, this is kind of further down the road, but really, you know, over here, what I'm doing is telling the virtual space to plot out where the, the X, Y, Z positions would be. Um, so in actual fact, yeah, because I know that the, 3D printer behind me, all that wants to know is it goes from point to point to point to point is I set up my code, I give myself a visualization so I can see what's going on. And then I output that straight onto a text um, uh, reader. Um, and in fact, this here is the code that goes straight to the printer. Um, and it's what we call G code. Um, and most computer guided um, machinery uses this G code as such. You know, a JPEG is the kind of the, the kind of code for a photograph. And then an SDL is the kind of code for a 3D model. And then dot G code is the kind of code that these machines tend to use. 